Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, lots of stuff in the news. The Live, Live Tour just merged with PGA, showing how important it is to take a moral stand. Anyway, uh, it's really incredible. Uh, I mentioned last week the importance of the metanumavirus. Uh, a lot of infections due to that. But, and I said it was gone. Well, there's a little blip. So metanumavirus is still around. So in the differential diagnosis, if somebody's got fevers, cough, headache, upper respiratory infections, it's either going to be COVID these days or metanumavirus. Now, of course, even my wife got COVID. So just recently. So it's all over the place. So one of our viewers actually pointed out that this huge surge in China really represents a big threat because of the possibility of uh, recombination. So if you look, right now the XBB strains are dominant. That's all in blue. There's a bunch of little mutations, but they're all pretty much related. The big concern is that we have something like what happened with Omicron, where we have a recombination event. As long as the virus is replicating, particularly in China, there's a huge possibility that we will see another recombination event. So we just have to keep, you know, keep our fingers crossed, but this virus has a way of uh, finding ways to infect people. The good news in the United States, the numbers continue to improve. Hospitalizations and deaths are down. Unfortunately, only 17% of our country has gotten up, uh, boosted with the updated booster. So we still have a pretty susceptible population for the XBB variant, which is why it is all over the place. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, deaths are down. But right now, if you think of the 200 a week that we're having, that, that uh, multiplies out to about 10,000 a year, which is about an average uh, flu season. So while the good news is it's acting a little bit more like an average flu season, there's still a lot of virus around. In fact, if you look at wastewater, 41% of the sites are, are showing, those are red or orange, uh, showing increases in viral load in the wastewater. And this just gives you some sense of that. The red dots represent detectable coronavirus in wastewater samples. So it is all over the country. And last week I showed you a picture of the, the individual dots uh, where there had been an increase, and there were very few. This week, look at this, the, the red dots represent a 1,000% increase in viral load. And it's pretty much all over, mainly in the Midwest, but sites in Texas, uh, in Arizona, California, the West Coast, uh, Oregon and Seattle, and even in New York. So that's, that's, that's not good. That just means there's a huge amount of virus that's replicating and in people all over the country. The Houston area is pretty good. We're down to about a 60% of the viral load that we had uh, about a year ago. So that's good, but we're, that's just a matter of time. I think it's pretty clear we're gonna have, we're gonna see this persistent infection rates all through the summer. And we'll have, just have to wait and see what, what happens in the fall. Hopefully, we will have a, a, an XBB-specific vaccine by the fall. I've been asked by a lot of people, should I get my second booster? If you haven't had your first booster, get, get one booster. But it, I'd wait for the second booster uh, until the fall just to see if we get an XBB-specific one. So the problem is, for us is really that long COVID is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And there is a study. There's actually a program that's called the Recover Program that's sponsored by the NIH. And one more example of why you should get a vaccine. This is Kaplan-Meier adjusted graphs for vaccinated versus vaccinated who gets long COVID. The blue line is uh, people who are not vaccinated. Uh, the vaccinated people are in the yellow line. And you can see the probability is much greater if you are not vaccinated. So it's very important that you get vaccinated. Uh, in, in addition to that, they're now about somewhere between seven, we don't know exactly, but somewhere between 10 and 20 million people that have long COVID in the United States. And the big concern is that we don't really have good medical evidence for why people are having this problem. Uh, so, we, you know, it's hard to come up with a treatment trial, but there is a treatment trial now that has started using Paxlovid as a treatment for long COVID. That study is enrolling now, and we should have data by uh, early in uh, the, uh, 2024. There have been two articles that were published this past uh, month in the British Medical Journal looking at long COVID for, at a population level. So in Zurich, Switzerland, they followed 
uh, a cohort of patients who had, who had been uh, unvaccinated and then got COVID and compared them to another group of people, just controls who were not infected, and they followed them for a year between uh, 2020 and 2021. And they surveyed 23 potential symptoms uh, for severity and complications uh, related to their uh, uh, COVID infection. And what happened was recovery after infection did not occur in 23% of, of individuals who were infected within six months. They got better slowly, 19% still had symptoms at 12 months and 17% at 24 months. So long t persistence of symptoms long after they had, they had gotten infected. Uh, so these are, these are, you know, it's getting to be a real problem, uh, more and more recognized. So there was a second paper in the British Medical Journal that looked at 30 uh, acute COVID symptoms and identified 13 combinations of these that people were having. And the most prevalent concern was fatigue, neurocognitive impairments, sort of that fog feeling, and chest symptoms. Uh, there was a recent uh, review by Eric Topol uh, from the Scripps Institute in Nature Reviews. And what his point is that it can really be uh, a debilitating disease. Many, many symptoms have been associated with it. And, you know, at least 65 million people worldwide are estimated to have long COVID. We don't know the mechanism, although he did a nice job of kind of summarizing the symptomatology uh, that, you know, people have chest pain, palpitations, cough. Uh, there's been an, an increased incidence in diabetes in patients, abdominal pain. There's this fog, cognitive impairment, um, and some uh, long-term fatigue. And if you looked at it, the VA study, which followed a, a large cohort uh, over several years, uh, after one year after the uh, di diagnosis of uh, COVID, uh, patients had an increased risk of cardiac arrest, death, diabetes, heart failure, pulmonary embolism, and stroke. And the, the hazard ratio is about threefold. So threefold increase in pulmonary embolism, uh, two and a half fold increase in, in cardiac arrest. Uh, and then the other symptomatology was chronic fatigue so syndrome, which was about 50% increase in concern. If you had a second infection, a breakthrough infection, that increased uh, your, uh, the chance of having one of these complications almost twofold. So he tried to hypothesize what the mechanisms are. There's not a lot of studies on it. One is that there's uh, con consideration is there, that there's persistent infection. And so that's one of the reasons why Paxlovid is being tried. The second possibility is that there's a change in your microbiome. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, there's very little data to support that, but uh, a lot of studies going on about that. The third possibility is an autoimmune response. We've seen a lot of autoimmune type symptoms, people getting uh, joint disease, even the issue of the diabetes may be a response, uh, an autoimmune response. Uh, increased clotting, and then this, this central nervous system disease. And one of the points he made, which I think is valid, uh, is that we've been so focused on the respiratory sequelae uh, in our long COVID clinics that we're not necessarily capturing all the other symptoms that are present with uh, long COVID syndrome. Uh, and even that our electronic medical records might be biased because we've been focused only on respiratory syndrome. So one uh, thing I wanted to mention that came out last week is a really interesting study that, you know, we've, we found that the, as, the, as the mutations of the virus take place, the monoclonal antibodies have been less and less effective. So, Every time there's a mutation, the monoclonal antibody directed to that specific variant. If there's a new variant, it doesn't work. So this is a, a group of people who, who created a monoclonal antibody platform that has multiple antibodies directed to different parts of the virus. Uh, and it's really kind of interesting. Uh, when they used this platform that took m many different antibodies towards uh, different parts of the virus uh, and tested it in, uh, in animals, there was a 30-fold increase in in uh, antibody titers. So this is a really interesting new therapeutic development that might bring back the use of uh, antibodies, but in more in a, in a multi-affinity um, approach. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. The first thing is uh, Common Spirit, the, our large uh, health system, uh, had a uh, Academic Excellence Awards Day and uh, three of our physicians uh, were awarded. Uh, three Baylor faculty member received the Common Spirit Health Physician Enterprise Academic Excellent Award. Uh, Dr. Bob Atmar, Professor of Medicine, and Dr. Dennis v uh, Villarreal shared the award for clinical research. 
and Dr. Yuriko Fukada, Assistant Professor of Medicine, received the award for medical humanities. Uh, one other really terrific award that came out this uh, past uh, uh, week, uh, the Vilcek Foundation and the Arnold Gold Foundation have announced that Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi, Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology, will receive the 2023 Vilcek Gold Award for Humanism in Health Care. Uh, obviously, Dr. Batazzi, along with Peter Hotez, created this vaccine that's being uh, distributed uh, all over the world. And this particular uh, 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 award recognizes outstanding, outstanding immigrant health care professionals in the United States. Uh, and there, the Vilcheks were also immigrants, and they wanted to point out the importance of immigration in the United States and how important it is for the intellectual and scientific development of our country. And of course, the last thing I want to point out is that on the 6th, Lily had her fourth birthday. Now, if there's ever a dog that is related to COVID, we got her right as COVID started. She's been in the office ever since. So Lily, happy fourth birthday. I can't wait to see you all next week. Oh, look at that. Got a little dog bone on it. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look. Oh, are you ready or what? Okay, cheers. Yay. Ha, ha, ha.